Happy New Year, YouTube. Welcome to 2020. I'm Rob Goodwin. This is Ketogenic Bodybuilding, and we're back after a long layoff over the holidays. I took a little break over the Christmas holiday, and uh, uh, then, uh, you know, a good day or two around New Year's to kind of recover and recharge my batteries and get ready for a big 2020, and I know it's going to be huge. We've got so many things going on, and uh, so I apologize for the lapse in video content, but we're back now and you're going to be getting a lot of weekly content now. So it's all good at this point. So uh, let me go ahead and get things rolling here. This is five uh, key tips on training that I believe, and I'll change the phrasing a little bit, that everyone should consider. And the reason I say that is because, you know, the the world of training, weightlifting, bodybuilding, I mean, it's... You know, it's been around for a very, very, very long time, and everybody, you know, seems to have an opinion or is deeply rooted in their belief system or ideology, and that's fine. And, you know, I'll preface all of this with saying if what you're doing works phenomenally for you, then don't change it. Keep doing what you're doing. We're all different individuals with different genetic components. However, if you feel like something may be lacking from your gains or results, perhaps giving some of these tips a try, see if it works for you, and at the very minimum, maybe the change up might help you bust through a stall or a plateau, or maybe create some level of excitement, you know, that you've maybe not been having in your training if things are becoming a little dull or lackluster. So everything that I employ, I will go ahead and say up front, I begin with looking at things through a rational and logical microscope. Everything has to be, it has to fit the logic test and the rationality test. And then I compare a lot of that with some of the science. And although in the world of exercise physiology, uh, there's so much conflicting information out there, a lot of uh, the research hasn't been done on the really hard training community the people as we like to say are looking to build that extreme physique to or as to where the overlying or ultimate goal is to increase skeletal muscle to the greatest degree that they possibly can and that's called hypertrophy um, adding or gaining as much mass and then maintaining it and that when that if that's the goal or we could simplify that by saying if your goal is to look spectacular naked then uh, these are the five things that I would recommend that you implement into your programming uh, to get the best possible result. Number one, uh, the most important thing that you can implement within your programming is increasing the intensity. Increasing the intensity. And by increasing the intensity, logically, rationally, in order for that intensity to be to its greatest possible effort, you would then want to back off of the volume. Uh, I've never truly understood, you know, once I learned these things over the years and, and worked with some of the brightest in the industry in the high intensity training world, uh, I walked away completely convinced that it is the best way to stimulate growth and keep it. So high intensity training Really, the, the hard and fast rules with that is, is you want to back off on the volume of work because it's unnecessary, and you want to increase the intensity of effort, which is very nece ne necessary to stimulate growth. The goal is to tear down systematically in the gym as much muscle fiber as possible, as many muscle cells as possible, to recruit as much muscle as possible tear that down in order to, as a defense mechanism, grow back uh, or overcompensate by growing more lean muscle tissue. That's the goal. We tear it down to grow more back. So the best way, logically, and from a physiological level, is the greater amount of intensity that you apply to that muscle, the greater recruitment of fiber will be achieved the greatest amount of tissue breakdown will occur. And therefore, if you give it proper recovery and feed it with the right raw materials to stimulate growth, then you will in fact gain the maximum level of muscle 
uh, as your genetics will allow. And we're gonna talk about genetics as well. So when I train, uh, I put forth the maximum level of intensity that I can, and then I give the greatest amount of recovery that I possibly can to ensure that I'm stimulating growth and that the muscle is giving the proper amount of time to uh, overcompensate and grow to the greatest degree before I hit those muscles again. If you look at this through a logical microscope and a rational microscope and even a physiological microscope, it makes the most sense to me that rather than more is better or how much training you can do, find the precise amount required to stimulate growth and then walk away recover that muscle, let it grow, and provided you feed it enough of the right raw materials to incorporate growth, that's how the magic happens. So rather than doing 10 sets at 60% of your maximum, because you can't give 100% effort on every set. If you're doing you know, 20 sets, 30 sets over the course of two hours in the gym, some crazy high volume marathon session. You may be getting some results from that. A lot of people do. But my argument would be, if you're getting decent results with this high volume approach, then if you changed it up and reduced the volume and increased the intensity, you're gonna get the maximum results that your genetics will allow. So I would definitely recommend, even if you're just, you know, you're dead set on this high volume approach, that's what you like, that's what you believe, then at the very minimum, try my suggestions for a four to six week block of your training and just change things up and put the experiment to the test. But I will tell you that high intensity, low volume training is not for the faint of heart. Uh, when I say intensity of effort, working a set to failure, I mean that you take those one, two, at the most three sets that you use for that exercise or that superset or whatever, and you put forth by far the greatest amount of effort you could possibly muster. And that means uh, a pretty brutal, excruciating workout. But the good news is, is my workouts typically never last more than about 30 to 45 minutes. So I go in with the greatest amount of effort that I can possibly apply. And then I do that for one to two sets generally, sometimes a third depending on the workout and its structure. And then I walk away from that set knowing that growth has been stimulated. So I, my advice to most people is back way off on the volume increase the intensity to the greatest degree that you possibly can. And that level of intensity takes time to develop because there's a mental barrier. There's a central governor that's going to try to stop you from continuing a set under that amount of, I'll go ahead and say it, pain. You know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a structured pain. And it's very, very uncomfortable to say the least. But if uh, once you get to that point where you've broken through those mental barriers and uh, can accomplish a set like that, then uh, I think you'll be a firm believer too of the results that can be achieved. Um, so I recommend you do at least one set, your last of any movement or group of movements to the point of 100% momentary muscular failure. So number one would be intensity and qualifying the term intensity would be reduced volume, a far greater intensity of effort, less sets, more effort. So number one is intensity. Number two is recovery. Intensity, recovery go hand in hand. They are equally important. Um, the recovery mechanism is as or more important than the actual stimulus itself. If you are not giving your body enough time to recover from the breakdown of tissue, then you're never going to allow the body to uh, put back or, and add as much muscle as you, would, uh, as you would like to. If you go work a group of muscles that have not yet fully recovered, you just short circuit the growth process. 
and you're kind of always digging a hole that you never properly fill back up all the way and then use there's no packing any dirt on top if you look at a good analogy would be a suntan you know, if, if you were pale and you decided, hey, I want to get a tan uh, for a trip I'm taking or whatever, if I told you to go to someplace south of the equator and lay out in the direct hot afternoon sun for eight solid hours, you would tell me I was insane. Why? Because if you did that, you'd be burnt to a crisp. That is not the goal. The goal is to systematically expose yourself to the precise amount of sunlight possible to create uh, enough light damage to then uh, overcompensate by you know, darkening your skin, which is really a defense mechanism. So rather than the more is better approach of more sunlight, more sunlight, you're just going to burn yourself to a crisp and create a long inroad to recovery. And if you are therefore burnt to that crisp from that eight hours of sun exposure, you're certainly not gonna go out the next day and do it again. You're gonna be laying in a bed full of blisters and burns and hating your life for about the next 72 hours. So instead, find the right precise amount required to stimulate the greatest amount of exposure to create the greatest possible result, which is a nice glowing dark tan. So it's the same with strength training. Recovery is when the magic happens. I say this all the time. I truly believe that most people are grossly overtrained. And this is why they often don't get the results they're looking for. But in their mind, they've been so programmed to think, okay, I'm working out six days a week, seven days a week, 20 sets per body part, and it's not happening. Well, shit. Then I'll go to, you know, two days, a, two, uh, two workouts a day and 30 sets or whatever. And that mentality is just completely backwards. And typically nothing ever really happens and, and no real... Um, uh, progress is ever made but when I take a client or, or take someone that comes to me for this advice and I give them a little time off greatly reduce the volume increase the intensity and make sure that they do not touch that body part again until they are fully recovered then we see the results start to happen recovery 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 rest those muscles and let them grow some people fear that if they recover too long then once that growth has been stimulated and overcompensation has occurred, that then some of that muscle is going to go away. That's not the way the body works. If it takes, let's say, hypothetically, just throwing out a, 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 a number of hours, let's say it takes 72 hours for your muscle to fully recover from the last session, even if that 72 hours has elapsed, and let's say you wait two, three more days to hit that muscle again, fear not. You're not losing any muscle. It's still going to be there until you're ready to train it again. You would have to go weeks, literally, before you would have to worry about actually losing mass, unless you're in some ridiculous caloric deficit or something like that, which most of you shouldn't be. Uh, so anyway, recovery, recovery, recovery. That's number two rest it, let it grow, and put a great, great amount of importance on sleep. Number three, this one's pretty cool. I'm a big believer in this, and a lot of people have forgotten this, and it was, you know, it's very popular in the high intensity community, and I think if you try this, and whenever I try this with a new client, they're just blown away at how it changes every exercise that they do. And uh, just yesterday, I introduced a new client to this type of training, uh, looking at cadence as a big factor. What do I mean? Let's take um, the three phases of any lift. Let's take bench press, for example. Now, we understand that when you're doing a bench press, you press the weight. The pressing of a weight is where you are the weakest. Once you press the weight, you can therefore at that point hold the weight. That is called the static phase of the lift. You are second strongest in the static portion of the lift. You are by far the strongest in the lowering phase, the eccentric phase of any lift. 
So it only stands to reason that you should put the most emphasis on the lowering of that weight. So in a bench press, the lowering of the bar is the most important part of the lift. The lowering of your body in a squat is the most important part of that lift or the lowering in a leg press. Uh, conversely, on a pulling motion like for back, the pulling of the weight, you're gonna be the weakest. But the, you know, the eccentric phase of bringing the weight back to rest is gonna be where you're the strongest. So that's where you accentuate it. Most people forget about that phase of the lift they just let the resistance of the weight and gravity bring the weight back to its starting position and they're wasting the most important part of the lift. Where cadence comes in, where you can train yourself to really take advantage of this is, and this sounds extremely elementary and simple, but I promise you it works, try it. The next time you do an exercise, let's say bench press again, I want you to think about the three, four cadence rule. And you can do this on just about any exercise. Some, not so much, but just about every common compound exercise you can. So in other words, on that bench press, I want you to do three full seconds up, four full seconds down, okay? Try that because the two biggest uh, enemies of training are momentum and gravity. In bodybuilding, if you're trying to create hypertrophy in the muscle, you want gravity and momentum taking out of the equation, okay? Now, in some sports-specific or competition-specific movements, they do need to be explosive. You know, I would never, you know, some of these five tips I wouldn't give to a power lifter. The power lifter's goal is to excel at three lifts, deadlift, squat, and bench press. So I would say, you know, every week, squat, deadlift, and bench press, and systematically get stronger and stronger and stronger. And do whatever it takes to make sure that you're able to get that weight from point A to point B um, it, with the rules provided by that particular federation. But in hypertrophy-driven workouts, if your goal is to put on as much muscle as possible, to look phenomenal naked, gravity and momentum are your enemy. So whenever I do a lift, I'll do, you know, roughly three seconds up, four seconds down, and then we will incorporate some high-intensity techniques to even accentuate that lowering of the weight, uh, such as heavy negatives, forced reps, things of that nature. So try the cadence approach the next time you train, and I think you'll find a different level of discomfort, and uh, you'll see that by allowing the muscle to do the work and not gravity and momentum, you're gonna get a lot more stimulation and a greater growth will then occur. So number three is cadence. Work on that three, four cadence rule. Number four quickly is understanding the role of genetics. Understand the role of genetics, this is important. We are all different human beings, with all with a different genetic makeup, a different genetic code, a different genetic component. Don't compare yourself to others. You know, one of the biggest enemies of the amateur bodybuilder physique enthusiast are the muscle magazines. You know, they're not as popular as they used to be because everything's online now, but, you know, even when I was young in the industry and in, in the business and training, I would look at these and think that the physiques of these pros with these cookie cutter workouts was the path to success. And then, you know, as I got to understand physiology and genetics and that whole component, I realized that, you know, some people are just genetically predisposed to putting on muscle. I briefly touched on the story of me when I first started training. I went from 168 pounds to my first big uh, jump. I, I got to about, I got over 200 pounds. I got to about 210, and that was inside of a year, which is, is pretty cool. And then ultimately I took my physique up to about 230, 233 pounds just from extremely hard training and a hard, hard focus on diet and recovery. And I also understood that I had a genetic predisposition to this. I know that I am a hyper responder. 
I discovered, I stumbled on to the fact that I was a hyper responder. My genetic makeup was that of being more fast twitch. Um, I just grew and I grew quickly and I always have. So, you know, some people that pisses them off and, but that's just the facts of life. If you put on muscle quickly, if you're a genetic hyper responder, thank your mom, thank your dad, thank your grandparents, because that's where you got it, okay? So then if you take those genetics, those genetic gifts that God gave you and incorporate them with the right training, intensity, nutrition, and recovery, then you just at that point strive to achieve your greatest genetic potential. You know, you have to look at things like connection points of muscle. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger is known for his incredible arms. His biceps are just, were unbelievable. Even in this modern era, you can look back at Arnold Schwarzenegger's arms and be impressed. His ridiculously large chest. But if you look at his physique, his biceps, the connection points were so long, they went deep within the elbow joint and way up high connection point on the shoulder. His chest seemed to almost wrap around him. It was so huge. And then you see people who have very short connection points, smaller muscle bellies. This is all just a genetic component. So for me personally, I had longer connection points. I had larger muscle bellies on most of my musculature. Um, I was born with bigger calves. My legs just grew. You know, these things just happened for me. So I, you know, thanked my, my parents and uh, uh, was thankful that I was able to learn the right approach to putting this genetic uh, makeup of mine uh, into motion and making it succeed. But my point here is not to say if you don't have those ridiculous hyper responder genetics that you should be discouraged. The goal should always be strive to be your absolute genetic best, whatever that is. Because if you get to your greatest genetic potential, if you discover the, the best path to achieving that, I assure you, you will be thrilled with whatever result that is. So, Listening to a video like this, I'm giving you some tips and approaches where you might alter your training a little bit, which might give you a little bit of an advantage working with your genetics. If you have a certain body part or even as a whole, your genetic disposition really isn't tuned to putting on muscle quickly and easily, then we have to change the approach and then honestly, you just got to work a little harder than everybody else. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. So understand that just looking at uh, an IFBB pro bodybuilder and thinking, oh, if he can do it, I can do it. If I follow this cookie cutter workout in Flex magazine that he didn't write, that the editors of the magazine pasted in there, and follow some, you know, cookie cutter nutrition plan and do just what Mr. Olympia did that you'll become like Mr. Olympia. Now that's not even remotely within the, 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 this, the realm of reason. Uh, it's just not going to be the way it works. But understand that you have to enjoy the journey of all this. And if you work as hard as you can and, and you just outwork everybody in the room and you put a rational, logical approach on your training and emphasize the most important components of training, you can achieve your greatest genetic potential and you will be happy with it. You may not win bodybuilding competitions, but really that's not what all this is, is about. It's not about trophies. It's about being your absolute best and building the most extreme physique that you possibly can to be the best that you possibly can. So. Just be realistic. Number four is understanding and being realistic with the role of genetics. Um, and lastly, number five is the nutrition component. A lot of this we will continue to cover to the point of exhaustion over the weeks and months of years that I continue to be a coach and do these videos and write and speak publicly. You have to understand that if the goal is to grow the amount, the greatest amount of lean tissue possible, then you must feed the muscles. So put a great, great, great premium and emphasis on protein consumption. Understand that if your goal is to put on as much muscle as possible, you must be in a caloric surplus. 
and then you got to make sure that you're feeding the muscles properly to incorporate that growth. So you feed the body the proper raw materials and protein is the most important because protein rebuilds cells and tissue and is responsible for muscular growth. And you allow those raw materials to work when you're at rest and you're recovering properly and then the magic will happen. And then uh, I truly firmly believe, and you know this or you should know this by now, that I believe in a targeted ketogenic diet approach. I do sprinkle a little bit of carbohydrates in around my workouts. Uh, for me, it's before and during. I do a pre slash intra workout uh, carbohydrate uh, blend. I do it from a supplement, but you can do it from real food for sure. Uh, you could do it with something as simple as, you know, a couple of rice cakes or a half a sweet potato or whatever. And I only take in about 18 to 20 grams of carbohydrate right before and during my workout, which only lasts about 30, 45 minutes as we discussed. And that's going to help me get this extra level of muscular energy from that glucose carbohydrate component and then I can spare uh, protein and allow protein to be used for what it's intended to be used for, which is growth and recovery. And then once a week, one day out of seven, I incorporate a carbohydrate, a, a very structured carbohydrate refeed. And we all know how I feel about refeeds and we discuss it often uh, in our ketogenic bodybuilding Facebook group. So one day out of seven, I will ingest a particular amount of carbohydrate to replenish muscle glycogen in my body to sort of reset my metabolic thermostat and uh, it works phenomenally well. And I think that that targeted slash cyclical refeed strategy for the hardcore weightlifter, trainer, athlete is an extremely useful tool that you should not be afraid of. Carbohydrates are not the enemy. It's just finding, like with everything, the precise amount required to gain a benefit without any spillover into detrimental uh, progress or results. So number five is understanding the role of getting adequate protein and using carbohydrate like a tool around your workouts and to refeed those muscles uh, once a week in a structured refeed. So I think we've covered enough. I think I've kept you long enough. Uh, we're going to go ahead and end this one. I really, really appreciate you being here and supporting what we do here. Please subscribe to the channel. Comment. If you have a comment, let me know what you think. And uh, I love to hear from you guys. It means a lot to me. And um, share this page with a friend. Uh, it means a lot to help expand our universe. So thank you again for everything. Thank you for being here. Uh, click that notification bell because we got more videos coming now that we're into 2020. It's back to work, back to business, and we're going to be churning out a lot of content. So stay tuned, more coming. But for now, enjoy your weekend, go train hard, and eat a steak.